Greetings in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. It is Wednesday in the Word time. It is time for us to fellowship in the Word of God. If you are like myself, you've just come out of a great time of celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I tell you what, I thank the team here at Word Alive Church for allowing our children, I mean, just those teams that got together and made sure that they had a, a moment that they could experience the Word of God and understanding of that Word relative to the resurrection. Well, thank God, because He lived, we live. Amen, amen. Well, we're going to pray and go right into our lesson. Father, we thank you for this time that we have together in your Word. We pray and ask in the name of your Son, Jesus. Christ that you will give us an understanding heart that father we will come to the word with the heart of faith believe in those things which you have said father believing that you not only exist but you are a reward of those who diligently seek you and that we will begin to put diligence in how we seek after you father by prayer by getting in your word by desiring spiritual things by being faithful in service father we honor you now we ask that you bless our time together and let it be fruitful in Jesus name amen well, take your Bibles and go to the Song of Solomon. We're in the eighth chapter now. Solomon is continuing, and the Shulamite, his wife, uh, primarily she's speaking now, uh, she is continually sharing, and him as well, uh, expressing their love for one another. Uh, they are not just talking it, they are exposing it. And I believe that this book, though it has prophetic insight relative to Christ in the church and relative to God in the nation of Israel, I believe there's some practical insight that God wants us to have as it relates to the marital relationship. So we're talking about God's design for marital love. It is totally different from the design that is in our world today, and I hope that Christians are not using that as a model relative to their marriages are going into a marriage relationship. So today in uh, chapter eight, we're gonna pick up at verse six. That's where we stopped in verse five in our last lesson. And I wanna call this uh, sacrificial love. Let me say that again, sacrificial love. That's a word that people have allowed the world to make it seem like it's a negative word and God sent Jesus to die for our sins, what he became, the sacrificial lamb of God. And so we want to talk about that because that's what she's communicating in verse 6. It reads like this, set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is as strong as death, jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Now, when we look at this particular verse here, the Shulamite loses, uses two similes and a metaphor in giving expression to her love. It is a mutual love. Remember, they're returning back from their getaway and she's laying according to verse 5a, who is this coming up from the wilderness leaning upon her beloved? So she's laying on his chest. And she's perhaps reminiscing about the time that they had spent together and how they were to go away and be able to revive their marital relationship. But when we look at this word, set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, uh, for love is as strong as death. A seal was not only a sign of ownership, but it was a sign of something that had great value. This type of ownership is not an insecure life of a wife of husband who has a need to control for whatever reason, but a sign of freedom, a sign of peace, and a sign of security. Paul talked about this kind of love in 1 Corinthians 13 when he talks about that agape, that God kind of love. And so here we get to see the greater experience of the security that comes with love. Let me say that, the greater experience. Yes, security is needed and necessary within a marriage relationship, but that security is second to love. For people just want to be in a marriage for security, that's selfish. There should be love. Solomon, the, the, the Shulamite is expressing love and she's expressing the security that there is going on between her in Solomon. Listen to 1 Corinthians 13, 7 and 8 because some believers have not learned to be secure in God's love. Therefore, they have to control things. They have to manipulate things. They walk in fear. If one spouse is running late, you know, they want to track them. They want to do all kinds of stuff. A lot of time, a lot of that's fear. 
I'm just being honest. A lot of it's motivated by fear. And it could be something that they had in their, spa, in their past when they, you know, was with somebody else and, you know, they got jilted or whatever. Okay, you got to get over that stuff. I'm just saying this security that the Solomon, Shulamite is experiencing and expressing is motivated by her love, not by her fear, her anxiety, her insecurity. But first and foremost, we, husband and wife, must find our security in God's love because human love can change. But God's love never changed. We see that today. People go through weddings and they commit the vows and they do all that and they even say, to death do us part. And sometimes that just become a temporary statement uh, because they end up departing before death. And I'm not judging or looking down on situations because there are some situations where people had to get out of certain circumstances. But my point I'm making is, as believers, let's come so secure in God's love that no matter what someone else does or do not do, we have security in God's love. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8, Paul gives some specific attributes and actions of this kind of love. Paul said, love knows no limit to its endurance, no end to its trust. Love still stands when all else has fallen. Now that's not emotional love, that's not human love, uh, that's not even brotherly love, that's agape, that's the God kind of love. Because why? Those who are walking in God's love, they know that I'm going to use the spiritual weapon that God has given me in this situation. Instead of word and feel I got to control and go behind somebody back and try to track them down, maybe I can spend that time just praying and trusting God and trusting God that he fully loves me, he accepts me, and he's not going to allow me to be taken advantage of. He's not going to allow me to walk in darkness, but I'm going to seek God. I'm going to draw closer to God rather than you going out there. You got people doing all kinds of stuff. What is that? That's an element of fear. That's not love. And a lot of times when people do that, they start talking like, I know what I'm going to get. What it is? Material things. And we're going to see where the shooter might make reference to that. That this love is much greater and more powerful than material things. Well, let's go on then. I'm just going down the scripture and letting the scripture speak to us. And then in Romans chapter 8, go ahead and take your Bibles and turn there with me. In Romans, this is Bible study. <laughs> so we speak in our Bible, going down the scriptures. But in Romans chapter 8, uh, Paul talks about the power of God's love. And I tell you what, when you get a revelation of God's love, you don't walk in guilt. You don't walk in shame. Even when you miss them all, you don't take three days to get back up and feel better about yourself and talk about, well, I let God down again. You cannot let God down. He is seated high and his train filled the temple. So in Romans 8, verse 35, listen to this. I'm talking about this love of God. Now, that's, that's the ultimate security that we have in love because people will change on you. All right, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? The answer is simply no, no one. All right, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or pearl or sore? What are those? All those are challenges in life things that we experience in life, difficulties, painful experiences, sufferings. Paul lists all of these things and his statement is simply none of this can separate us from the love of God. So when you're going through a difficult season in your life, don't ever think God doesn't love you. Don't ever think God, you know, he's punishing me because of something I did long time ago. Have you repented? Have you asked Christ for forgiveness? Well, last time I read, the Bible said Jesus is the only one who can forgive sins. So you need to walk in the liberty whereby Christ has made you free, according to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. There's a freedom that comes in Christ. Well, let me go on down. He said, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. So he made reference to this Old Testament prophecy. And basically what he's doing, he's emphasizing some of the sufferings and challenges that Christians go through living in a fallen world where Satan is the God of this world. Verse 37, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. There go again. Why do we overcome these things? Because God loved us. Because he loves us. That's how we overcome these things. That's why we are more than conquerors. Because God loves us. And then it goes on. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, 
nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us, here go, from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Look at the power of God's love. Nothing can separate you and I from the love of God. And Paul began to talk about things that's in the invisible realm. He talked about things that in the spirit world. None of these things can separate us from the love of God. And I would encourage us because, again, until you get a revelation of God's love for you, how much he has done to prove to you he loves you, how he came and died for your sins, how he freely gave you eternal life when you turned to faith in Christ, how he forgave all of your sins, past, present, and future, how he's promised you eternal life with him, all of that is an expression of God's love. So make sure you're secure in that love now. If you're a spouse, a husband, a wife, and you're trying to work to get your wife to love you and to do all this, I want to tell you that if you try to buy love, that's not real love. Matter of fact, so, uh, the shooter might going to talk about that. He said, if you try to buy love, people laugh at you. And don't you laugh at people when they go around there talking about, I got her this, I got him this, I got her this, I got him this, and, and trying to buy love, trying to buy love. I tell you what, man, these times that we're living in now, there's some things that our younger generation is doing, especially females, when it comes to men, that, man, I tell you what, the women of old would not have allowed that. They would have told them, have some self-dignity, have some self-respect. Don't stoop that low. And I believe that a man will take a woman as low as she allow him. But remember I said, as she allow him. Have a standard. Don't let him play you. Don't let him manipulate you. Don't let him give you false hope. Don't let him put you on the side while he's still out there trying to uh, uh, grow up. That's what he's doing. He's trying to mature. A lot of times men don't commit to one woman because sometimes now they don't have the maturity. And sometimes because they're married to their moms and they don't know what it means to be committed to another woman because mom is fulfilling that role. It's sad, but that is true. Well, let's move on. So here, let's go back now. The Shulamite here, she talks about this kind of love uh, that she's experiencing in her heart as it relates to her relationship with her husband. When believers have found their ultimate security in God's love, then their faith becomes a weapon in their human relationships. Remember I made reference to that? When you're secure in God's love, you're not going to walk in fear. You're not going to be running behind somebody trying to find out what they're doing and all that kind of stuff. You're going to rest in God because you got some powerful weapons. Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 13 and 13, listen to what the scripture says. And now these three remain. What three? Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Notice, the greatest of faith, the greatest of hope is love. Love never ends. Love never fails. But again, we're not talking about this worldly love that's full of lust and all the laziness and all this kind of stuff, people taking advantage of people. I'm talking about the love that you can only have when you come to faith in Christ and you open your heart up and you let God pour that love in your heart through the Holy Spirit and you begin to allow God to change you, to bring you into a place where you are not being conformed to this world, but that you're being transformed by the renewing of your mind, where you are presenting your bodies unto him as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. All right, let's move on. Now, when it comes to praying, that's a weapon. And when you are securing God's love, prayer is going to be your go-to. And so prayer keeps fear out. Prayer lets you know that your ultimate security is not provided by a man or woman, but it's provided through your relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, in 1 John uh, chapter 4, verse 18, listen to what the scripture says. I know you love the word. Hallelujah. That's why you keep coming to the table of truth. I know you love the scriptures. That's why you keep joining me for Wednesday in the word. You prioritize it. Some people prioritize the news. They got to pre-record. I got to get home and listen to the news. I got to listen to the 6.30 news. I got to listen to the 6 o'clock news. I got to listen to the 7 o'clock news. They rush home. They preset their thing so that uh, their DVR or whatever so they can listen to all that bad news. I'm not saying we shouldn't be informed, but when you're informed, make sure you're praying. Make sure you're trusting God. My point I'm making is this. We prioritize things that has nothing to do with developing our faith and building up our spirit, man, and the things that builds up our faith, that builds up our spirit, man, we often neglect and wonder why the spiritual fruit is not manifesting in our life. 
and some of the blessings that God wants to lavish upon us. Well, in 1 uh, John 4, 18, the scriptures say, there is no fear in love. That's God's love. Remember I said, people try to say, well, you know, I'm not operating in fear. I just want to make sure I'm secure as an element of fear. That doesn't mean you make sure things are in order. That doesn't mean you sit down and check out the business affairs of the marriage. You should be involved. When you got one person involved and they got all the knowledge, that's, that, 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 that's going to be a bad experience. They got all the information and all of a sudden they leave here suddenly and just go and now you got to go through a haystack trying to find a needle. That should not be the case. You need to be able to ask questions. You need to be able to sit down and have conversation about matters and uh, relative to what if something happened to you? Well, I'm going to move on now. All right. And then, you know, you got cases where one, I knew a case one time, nobody in our church, nobody in our church, where the wife had everything laid out. Made sure that we know when she leave, wanted the husband to maintain that lifestyle. And, uh, and so when I, she shared that with me, I said, what about him? She said, well, he won't share nothing with me. And you mean to tell me you're going to go there and lay out a, 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 a luxury plan for him to be able to live a lifestyle that he won't even show you the respect to share with you what's in his will if he has one? And some of them won't get a will. And they don't want a will because they don't want to commit themselves to making sure they're honoring you. Because they're probably somebody else they're looking to honor. Well, I'm going to leave that alone. But these are real cases. And when you know that's going on, you walk in wisdom with those type of situations. Well, let's move on. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. Notice, the one who fears is not mature in love. The one who fears is not free in their love. What kind of love? God's love. The security of the ultimate love that they have in their relationship with God. I want to lay this down because that's where it began. You and I have to be secure in the ultimate love relationship that we have in the earth. And that is our relationship with God and our relationship with our marriage partner is next to that relationship. Well, let's go on now. The Shulamite, she continues uh, to expound on the security of the love experience between both her and Solomon. She uses uh, two similes and one metaphor to give expression to that. And so we got to take time to really unpack this because in verse 6, uh, B, she says, for love is as strong as death. Love and death in the same sentence. You would say, man, that don't, that don't fit together. But we got to understand what she's saying here. What she's saying is that love this kind of love has no ending. You know, when we do marital ceremonies, we have a ring and we hold it up and say this ring uh, symbolizes the unending love that this couple uh, have for one another. A lifelong devotion to the marriage, to the point where they both declare in that marriage vow that unto death, uh, do we part and so when the Shulamite is making reference to for love is as strong as death what she is saying is that this love she's sharing with her husband is an unending love and there is a devotion to this love relationship in our marriage that will never end it's about the continuous of the marriage love it is about the devotion to the married love. They don't have to worry about the person being around others. And all of a sudden, they're looking for love. They will find that their love is within the context of their marriage. Now, I'm just rightly dividing the word. And when I'm rightly dividing the word, there are times God will give me wisdom to address different type situations because we got some situations out there that people don't have biblical answers for. We've got situations out there where they're going to uh, the world for counsel. And the Bible says, do not walk in ungodly counsel. So what kind of counsel should I walk in? Godly counsel that is based on the word of God and the principles of the teachings of the messages of Christ and the apostles, the instructions that God has given us in his book. And so she talks about that for love is as strong as death. Now she uses another simile here and she says jealousy 
as cruel as the grave. You see, jealousy in Old Testament scripture, again, that's a negative word in our society, but in Old Testament scripture, the Bible talks about it in a positive way because the Bible says God is a jealous God. God is jealous over those who are supposed to be followers of him. And the Bible speaks of a righteous jealousy. Again, what she is communicating is positive, is a positive aspect of the faithfulness of their love relationship. So even though she uses some negative words, jealousy and death, she's not talking about jealousy in the sense of bondage, jealousy in the sense of control and manipulation and fear. She's talking about healthy jealousy. And, uh, and she talks, so she's talking about the commitment of the love relationship. Remember in 5.8, I'm gonna read it again. Who is this coming up from the villainous, leaning on her beloved? Where is she? Resting on his chest. Reminiscing about that time they've spent together. So everything's coming out of her mouth now is positive. She's had a very enriching moment with her husband and uh, she wants to make sure that they don't just go back to business as usual. So she's having a conversation with him. Now, the kind of jealousy the Shulamite refers to is a jealousy that seeks to preserve what one already possess. She and Solomon already possess uh, a love for each other. It's not one-sided. And this kind of healthy jealousy focuses on prioritizing the other marital partner and protecting them from the lure of temptation and unfaithfulness. You know, I've seen cases sometimes a person want to try to push a person out there so they can get some, you know, evidence. And usually, why do they want evidence? So they can get stuff. It's all about material things. And I'm telling you what, if you got the God of materialism ruling in your heart, you're going to dishonor God's word. You're not going to follow what the word tells you to do. You're going to try to do things. And that happens. But the Shulamite, she's saying here that when we get back home, Solomon, we're not going back to business as usual. We're going to prioritize one another. We're going to prioritize our time together. And uh, we're going to protect one another from temptation and unfaithfulness. Listen to 2 Corinthians 11 and 2. The Bible says, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. So there's a godly jealousy. For I betroth you to one husband. Notice, I'm not sharing you with nobody else. I betroth you to one husband. Who is that husband? So that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. Well, we don't want to even hear the word virgin now in our society. People look at that as that, you know, that's a bad thing to be a virgin. Isn't it bad that we're living in a time now where that mark of virginity was a sign of honor that that wife would bring to that husband and for her family. They cherished that too as well. It was part of the culture. But that's not the case now. People laugh at somebody who may be a virgin. And they don't have that type of honor, and I hear people say, well, when I get forgiven, God restore my virginity. God ain't restore your virginity, just be real. You know, <laughs> you just need to be real. You're forgiven, yes, I'm forgiven. But don't go trying to get all deep and you know, oh God, now nah, he didn't make you a virgin again. You gave that up when you, when, when you engaged in sexual relationship outside of marriage. And some of them have children and talk about God restore my virginity. The evidence is standing right there. <laughs> I'm sitting right there. But let me move on. I'm saying sometimes Christians get weird with this uh, faith stuff. Now you are forgiven if you ask God to forgive you. Yes. Now you need to move on and don't try to get all deep like you this pure virgin that's never been touched. Well, I'm going to go on. And same thing for women and men. Men supposed to be virgins too. So I'm not coming with an imbalanced approach to this. But I've seen here uh, uh, females make that sometimes. I don't hear men say that. Men don't even talk like that. Well, let's go on. Then he brings another, but this is a metaphor here. He says, and uh, it's, uh, she says, it's flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. So what is she saying here? This is a metaphor designed to focus on the intensity of the flames. In other words, the Shulamite is saying that this love is so powerful, no matter how much water you try to pour on it, you can't quench it. You can't put it out. Can you imagine a fire that's burning and, and all of a sudden you throw bucket after bucket after bucket of water and all of a sudden it keeps burning? But that's how powerful this love is. And that's, the powerful, that's how powerful God wants love to be. That's, get this now, God's design for marital love. Again, I have to keep emphasizing this is God's design. And believers have, you know, I was thinking earlier 
I say, you know, anytime people have challenges in their marriage, and we all do, I don't care who you are, you will have challenges in your marriage. But I believe if a husband and wife, they could be at the door of divorce right now. And if both of them are believers, now notice, if they are Christians, they first of all need to be willing to commit themselves to God's word and obey the word of God. And if both are willing to obey the word of God, I believe if you get these teachings and start from the beginning and listen to these teachings, I believe you're going to get the answers you need. You're going to get the humility you need. You're going to find out that forgiveness is the, is the answer to the situation. You're going to decide that you're going to do what is necessary to do your part to make it work. And you're going to trust God. But see, both partners have to be committed to that. Sometimes you got one partner committed and the other one not. And I want to encourage you, keep doing what you know to do. Because the reality is this. If they're not willing to obey God's word, if they're not willing to come under the authority of scripture, the Bible tells you in 1 Peter chapter 3 that you can win them without a word. Well, you make sure you do that now. Don't just make an excuse. Well, he's a heathen and he ain't saved. He won't go to church at all. You knew that before you married him. So don't get all deep now. He wasn't doing that. And if he did that, it was a fake just to get you to marry him. And you need to face reality that he pulled a fast one on you. But that's no excuse for you to run and think you can get out of it. But you have to make sure you've done your part. And I believe when a person has done their part, God gives them the umpire of peace and they know what to do based on what God is speaking to their heart. Based on what God, because God knows the future. Matter of fact, the Bible says God knows the end from the beginning. And he knows whether or not that person going to change or turn. And so you make sure you draw closer to God, get more intimate with God, walk in obedience to God's word, and let God balance the book in that situation. But make sure you don't have an undercurrent spirit and just get deceived by the devil and try to do things to justify yourself and make yourself look good. And people do that in the church setting. They try to make themselves look good. Well, you know what the bottom line is this. God is the ultimate judge. And so we're going to have to stand before him. Well, let me move on now. In verse 7, she comes now. She said, many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it will be utterly despised. I call this the strength of love. The Shulamite reflects on the strength of their love. Remember, again, they just returned from time alone and she has many memories perhaps uh, of how life was prior to that, the contention that may have been in the marriage, the lack of communication that had been going on in the marriage and they went and spent some time one-on-one -on -one with one another and, and evidently they flushed that out. They worked that out. They talked that out. And now they're back and she's talking about what she's looking forward to in this new uh, uh, priority that uh, both are going to place within the marriage relationship. Now, continue with the metaphor of fire. Imagine someone continually throwing buckets of water. I made reference to that and can't put it out. Well, this love uh, we often confess during our marriage vows. We talk about the power of that love. You know, sometimes when people do those marriage vows, you know, they'll say immediately, I want to do the traditional marriage vows. I often ask people, you know, I got about three or four different uh, types of marriage vows, marriage vows that are used in uh, a lot of your spirit-filled churches that's really word-centered and word-based. I have the traditional marriage vows, and I let them choose which one they want to use. And some say, I want to use the word-based marriage vows and some things you don't find in the word-based marriage vows and uh, that you may find in the traditional vows. And one thing in traditional vows, I don't know if they're still using this, but this is the part that people remember. Is that anyone here today see why these two should not be joined together? I always wondered about that. Because first of all, it ain't none of their business. Secondly, you don't have to get their permission in order to marry the person that you believe you want to marry. Matter of fact, the scripture says in Proverbs 18.22, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. You know, sometimes in these cases with marriage relationship, mothers think ain't no woman good enough for their son. And I, I, I was at a restaurant one time and no one in my church, I wouldn't dare share about anyone in my church. I don't even know this person. And we just started talking and the person started talking about his mother and his wife. So when he started telling me all that's going on, I say, well, how did you allow this to happen? He looked at me. I say, something happened that you allowed some boundaries to be crossed for your mother to be able to have this kind of uh, access into your marriage to whereby uh, he made reference to the fact that she literally told his wife you were not my first choice so and so was my first choice what kind of arrogant mother is that and you know what I blame the son I said first of all 
you should have dealt with your mom. I tell people in marriage relationship, don't let your spouse go and have to deal with your crazy family folk. <laughs> you deal with them, you know? You deal with your mom, you deal with your dad if they're overstepping their boundaries. Cause they're gonna blame the other person. They go, oh, oh, he's controlling her, she controlling him. And then, you know, in some cases people do get into a control system and all that. They don't want you to be in relationship with other people. You're not, uh, 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 you know, dismantle the relationship, but the relationship change. And but it's communication, it's respect. And a lot of time in those marriage relationships, a mother has a tendency to overstep those boundaries. And that daughter-in-law, boy, she may not never recover from that. And then she start having them grandchildren, and you think she's gonna bring her grands to stay with you, and you don't like her, you don't respect her, and you think she's gonna let her grands come and be uh, indoctrinated to have some type of attitude. I'm just saying, man, people got to wake up and look at the bigger picture. You know, let that husband and wife work those things out. Whoever he chooses or she chooses, they got to live with that. And if you feel they made a bad choice, you got to realize that all you can do is pray and trust God. Well, I sense the, uh, the, the anointing to share that because that's so many homes are divided because people don't set boundaries when they get married and they let people overstep boundaries and it create contention to hear this person trying to, I got to choose between my mama and my husband. Or I got to choose between my mama and my wife or my uh, daddy and my wife or my daddy and my husband. I'm talking across the board. If you ever feel you got to choose, something was not done the right way. The right boundaries were not put in place. And then you do things together with one another when it comes to families. If you're going to visit over to your family, take him with you and vice versa. Let your family see that y'all are, are a unit. And they invite you, but don't invite your spouse. You shouldn't even go. If they give you an invitation to some and don't invite your spouse, you should tell them, you know what? I'm not single. I am a whole person. Hallelujah. But I'm going to move on. Finally, she uses the material wealth of a man's house as having no value in comparison to the value of love. The imagery here is that of sacrificing something. To sacrifice something for love is to set it apart to make it holy. And Jesus modeled this kind of love. In John 15, 13, the Bible says, Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for his friend. Didn't Jesus lay down his life for us? And in John 15, he called us friends. He said, I no longer call you servant. He didn't say you're not servants. He said, I don't relate to you on that level. I call you friend now. I call you friend. There's a more closer, intimate relationship that you and I have. And then over in John 13, 14 and 15, uh, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. You know, a lot of time in marriage relationship, one person wants the other person to do all the, all the serving, all the work, you know. Uh, I've seen men sometimes working two, three jobs, and wife sitting at home, just a healthy as a bud, ain't got no children at home, and, uh, and he, he struggling. Seemed like she should say, wait a minute, I don't want my husband to struggle like that. I can go out and I can bring income in the home and we can work together and enjoy the lifestyle we want. See, some people want the lifestyle, but they don't want to do the sac make the sacrifice to get it. They want to put it on somebody else and make the other person feel like you obligated to take care of me. Now, that's a lazy person. And uh, I tell you what, <laughs> you're going to be shocked at the end of the day because that person, no, this is not, this is not a fair ground. This is not, I'm doing all the work. I'm doing all the labor and you don't even do anything for me. You won't even cook me a meal. I'm just saying people hold that stuff in their heart. And, uh, and a lot of time at the funerals, people be surprised. <laughs> they be surprised. Well, listen to first Corinthians 13, four and five. Jesus said, the Bible say, love is patient, Paul, and is kind. Love doesn't envy, love doesn't brag, is not proud, doesn't behave itself inappropriately, doesn't seek his own way, is not provoked, takes no account of wrong. So when the Shulamite makes reference to if a man will give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. You know what she said? People are laugh at him if he's trying to buy love. And I want to say to anybody that's trying to buy love, you'll find out that you got to keep making a purchase. You keep giving them things. You keep doing things to, to try to buy love. You can't buy love. Love is freely given. God demonstrated his love for us. Even when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We are accepted in the beloved. 
God didn't wait for us to get saved, to get born again before he revealed his love to us. God is love. And so we see here then the Shulamite, uh, she, 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 she's really enjoying this. She's sharing, all this is positive that she's saying in verse 6 and 7. Just got back from time away, laying on the breast of her husband and just reminiscing about what they can look forward to. And you should be able to look forward to things when you get together, talk, flush things out, come in agreement, forgive one another. You should stop living in the real view mirror of your marriage. Talk about, I remember when you did this. Oh, you hurt me so. Man, when people do that, you wonder, where is their faith? Hadn't you handled that with God? I don't know about you, but a lot of things I've handled with God, my relationship with God, have allowed me to handle certain things. And you can handle some things with just you and God when you're willing to do what the Word says. And it takes faith to do that. But some people are so tired in their feelings, that's what they live by. Well, let's move on. Now, I have a few faith action questions, just two, that I want to encourage us and challenge us. Let's put this stuff to work. It works. It's the Word. And the Word works, but we have to work the Word, right? All right. In what ways are you genuinely displaying the unselfish and sacrificial love, love toward your spouse that is God honoring. This is not a one-sided marriage. But one person sitting down watching the other person say, I want to see if you're serious. I want to see if you're going to do the things you said. Well, what about the things you need to be doing? And I think if a husband and wife both focus on what the word has told them to do in the marriage relationship, they both are going to draw closer to God. They're going to get closer to one another. Why? Because the closer you get to God, y'all are going to end up at the same point. Where you going to end? Closer to Christ. And he's the one that makes the difference. Another question is, if healthy jealousy is expressed in your marital love, how much peace and freedom does it bring in your life and how inspiring is it in your faith? You know, when you walk in fear, the devil got a battleground in your mind. Yeah, he, he put landmines there. He know you got fear and then he'll put thoughts in your mind and people start talking about dreams. They done had all them dreams are lies because of what you allow to be manifested in your thought life that's motivated by fear. It's not revelation God's giving you. And a lot of times when they check it out, it's not, there's no facts to it. There's no truth to it. What? Fear opens the door to the devil. He knows the fear is there. So he brings those thoughts that create anxiety, fear, and bondage. Be free from that. Know that you are secure in Christ first and foremost. And then in your marriage relationship, there should be security. But it should be mutual security. It should be the security that the wife experienced of a person that's committed to the marriage and prioritizing the marriage. It should be a security that the husband is experiencing, that the wife is committed to the marriage and she prioritized the marriage. That's what brings the security. Not you saying, well, I know we got, we got a good life in showing power. Those things are good. You know, those things are fine. That's just part of, you know, having stuff in order. But if you all concerned about how much life insurance you're going to get when the person go and you treat them like a dog, you might be surprised at the end of the day. <laughs> well, let me move on. We have a few announcements. The first one, I want to thank the team for providing such a resurrection experience for us here at Word of Life Church. It was a great time. I want to thank all those who work with our children, our nursery ministry. We appreciate your faithfulness to the Lord and your commitment to Jesus Christ. So that's what we end up reaping from. We reap from your commitment to Christ. You are followers of Christ, imitators of God as dear children, walking in love, doing those things that represent Christ. Remember Jesus said, what I've done, I set an example. You need to wash one another's feet. A lot of times people don't want to serve others because, first of all, it's not convenient. Secondly, they think it's a waste of their time. I'm telling you what, when you learn to serve people, when you learn to honor the saints of God and the work of God, you're going to see God's just going to bring stuff in your life. And don't worry about people getting jealous. They're going to talk about you whether you're doing good or doing bad. I'd rather them talk about me doing good for the glory of God. Well, another uh, thing I want to share with you is that, you know, periodically I sense the leading to remind us of Wednesday and the word, you know, we initially was coming together in person and we just sensed that that was not something the Lord laid on my heart to go back and, you know, to start it up again. We got to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I didn't sense the Lord leading me and I sense the Lord leading me to use this tool we've been using, coming in and ministering the word. It's still the word of God. It's still the anointing. And, uh, and so I want to thank you for being committed to this time. Now, you have to work on your flesh. Somebody said, well, you know them people are not going to sit down and sit down and listen to you on that. Well, if they're committed to Christ, they will. If they're committed to the word, they will. Sometimes we think we got to put controlling mechanism on people to get them to obey God. But if their heart is not in it, I'm telling you, they're just going through the motion. 
But I would encourage you that when we were gathered together and Wednesday in the Word, you all know this, we would receive gifts. We would receive offerings. We would honor God in our giving. And we didn't do this out of obligation. We did this because we were motivated by love. Matter of fact, Proverbs 11:25, the scripture says, the liberal soul of the generous person shall be made fat, that means prosperous, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. I'm telling you, you a stingy person, start asking God to deliver you and start looking for opportunity to give. You say, well, I don't have a lot. Look at the woman in the Bible when she gave that little, but yet it was an abundance because she gave in faith and she gave because she loved God. So I want to encourage you, stop being stingy, stop thinking somebody got to always do for you and look for opportunity that you can be generous, the liberal. So don't be limited to your family. Some people, boy, if they family, they're going, oh, blood is thicker than water. And some of that stuff God got you, that you're doing, God telling you to stop it because you're enabling them. They're irresponsible. They're not changing. And when you leave the earth, ain't nobody going to give them no cushion like that. So stop it. I mean, God will tell you that. And so uh, I want to encourage you. Make sure that you have a giving spirit. That means it don't have to be family. It don't have to be somebody that you know relationally. You can be led by the Spirit of God. You've done your due diligence. You know the situation. You studied it out. And you know it's for a good cause. Be a generous person. Because the Bible says the generous soul shall be made fat. He that watered others. He that blessed others. He that supplied to others. He that sowed into the lives of others. God say, you're going to get it back. He's going to make sure that you're going to be fat. Now, he's talking about what? Wealth and riches, provision. The other scripture I have here is in uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each one must give as he has see, decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. See, I believe all giving should be motivated by scripture, by the word of God rightly divided. These scriptures pertain specifically to giving. So I'm not taking scripture out of context. In this scripture here, Paul basically said that when you give, God looks at your heart. He's not looking at what's in your hand. He's looking at what's in your heart. And that God loves a heart that is, that, 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 that is cheerful about giving, that is excited about giving. They look for When they start talking about giving, they, they, they don't just fake it by screaming and all that and know they ain't giving nothing, but they really look for an opportunity to give. If the pastor sends a leading to take up a special offering for a family, they're not sitting there like, what's going on with them? They just trust that leadership and have done their due diligence and that we want to be a blessing to this family to help them in their time of need. Well, I know you've been blessed by the word of God. I know God's word is strengthening your faith and building you up in your faith because that's what it's designed to do. Faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And, uh, and I hope I'm helping people. You know, sometimes, like I said, we don't talk, talk about the things that need to be talked about. And people got some serious issues going on in marriage, marital relationships. Christians got some serious issues going on in marital relationships. And a lot of that stuff is because outsiders are coming in and creating all kinds of confusion and chaos. And, uh, and you got to set boundaries. I'm sensing the Lord leading me to just keep emphasizing that. It doesn't mean you cut people off. Now, some people you may have to cut off. If you got a fiery person, you say, I don't care what you say. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And all I bought you into this world and I'm going to take you out. Cut them off for a season. You may have to cut them off for it. That's a spirit you're dealing with. And it's a Jezebel spirit. And when you're dealing with a Jezebel spirit, it is a spirit that has the control that comes and doesn't respect any kind of order, doesn't respect any kind of system of authority. It's going to come in and it's going to disrupt. It's going to do, it, it will literally kill a person. That Jezebel spirit will destroy a life to get what they want. But I want to let you know sometimes you have to disconnect Spend a lot of time in prayer and let God deal with some things in that heart and get them delivered from those uh, unclean spirits, those demons. Some of those spirits are demons, devils. You know, and these people could be people go to church every Sunday, but they're full of devils. Just because you go to church doesn't mean you don't have devils. Matter of fact, when Jesus went into synagogue, a lot of times it was there that people got delivered, you know. And so I'm just saying, we got to be wise as serpent, but harmless as dove. And if you need wisdom, ask God to give it. He'll give you wisdom in every situation. Well, I know you've been blessed by the word. I want to encourage you to join me again, Lord willing, next week, Wednesday in the word. God's design for marital love. God bless you and have a great day in Jesus' name.